Sometimes I forget to pick things up after the previous week's service. This is what remains of Crow's awesome list from last week. For those of you who weren't here with us, my friend Crow came to visit us all and the kids here at the front of the sanctuary. She was having trouble being herself because she didn't think she was awesome enough all on her own. And so we all kind of crowdsourced a list of all the things that made Crow special all on her own. You can see she's left some of herself behind on some of the sticky parts here as well. I love that exercise, that list of awesome for ourselves. Confession time, who went home and at some point in that next week started making that list for themselves? Have you ever sat down? Not to, not to think of it as a vanity project, but a, but a project in self-care. Sit down and list out all the wonderful things about yourself. Because sometimes we need that reminder. There is a malaise in this world of being unkind to oneself. Lord knows I struggle with it constantly. I give in to that inner critic voice, that voice on my shoulder that tells me everything I do is awful. Everybody can see right through you. They know you're making it all up as you go along. Everybody sees it. You're not fooling anybody. I have to take that time every so often to go, yeah, but look what I did. Look what I can do. Look how I've helped. Look what is inside me. It's good to do that exercise. I encourage you to try that at some point this week. Sit down and make your awesome list. Be kind to yourself for a couple of hours at least. It makes a, a difference in how we approach our weeks. But on the other hand, not everything about me is awesome. Not everything about you is awesome either. I know I tell you constantly, you are enough, you are good. But let's be honest, none of us is perfect. There's plenty inside us that ain't so great. And sometimes, sometimes we need to take a moment to list that out too. Not to beat ourselves up. Not to break ourselves down partly as a counter to that awful inner critic voice, which has the kernel of truth to it occasionally, but also lies its face off to us all the time. You need to sit down and make that not-so-awesome list. You can go, okay, yeah, but there's a limit, critic, okay? Yes, I'm terrible this far, but not that far. Come on, let's be reasonable about it. It's good to name all these things. Because I'm more and more convinced that we can't do anything with our lives if we can't give a name to the things within ourselves and the things around us. I can't celebrate what is good within me if I cannot give a name to it. And I can't start to correct or fix what might be broken inside me if I cannot give a name to that as well. And so I need to sit down and I need to make both lists. Let's think about ourselves as a list of wholeness and brokenness, talents and flaws, good and bad. I, I have made a list of ideals here. You can see it says ideal, ideal, ideal. I wasn't feeling very creative this morning. That's one of my flaws. <laughs> there it is. Everything I know within me that is good, that has a chance to do something good for the world. And on the other hand, the list of everything imperfect about me, the things I don't like about myself, my slow burn and quick outbursts when I get angry, the way I criticize myself too hard or go into worst case scenario mode when I have a decision to make, all of that stuff. And then somehow I need to deal with it and contain it. Parker Palmer talks about how we hold everything, how we contain all of that 
when we come to understand ourselves. There's two ways he talks about of pre presenting ourselves to the world when we come to understand ourselves and all of our goodness and all of our flaws, all of our talents, all of our brokenness. Of course, there's the ideal way we would love to present ourselves to the world. All of those ideals, all there on the surface for everyone to see, to try to lift ourselves up, put it all out there, everything good about us. But then what happens, of course, is that all of that flaw, all of that brokenness winds up walled in on the inside. We end up living frequently a divided life, he said, walled within ourselves. And the divided life is no way to live. It leads to that blizzard that he talks about in his introduction. The divided life comes in many and varied forms, he writes. To cite just a few examples, it is the life we lead when we refuse to invest ourselves in our work, diminishing its quality and distancing ourselves from those it is meant to serve. We make our living at jobs that violate our basic values, even when survival does not absolutely demand it. We remain in settings or relationships that steadily kill off our spirits. We harbor secrets to achieve personal gain at the expense of other people. We hide our beliefs from those who disagree with us to avoid conflict, challenge, and change. We conceal our true identities for fear of being criticized or shunned or attacked. Dividedness is a personal pathology, but it soon becomes a problem for other people. It is a problem for students whose teachers phone it in while taking cover behind their podiums and their power. It is a problem for patients whose doctors practice medical indifference, hiding behind a self-protective scientific facade. It is a problem for employees whose supervisors have personnel handbooks where their hearts should be. It is a problem for citizens whose political leaders speak with forked tongues. The divided life divides, that sounds like a tautology, but I think it has to be said out loud, divides us from one another and divides us from ourselves. Once upon a time and not so long ago, I lived like this all the time. There were things about myself that not necessarily I hated, but I didn't want to share with anybody. And so I partitioned myself off in parcels. This piece was for you, and this piece was for them, and that piece was for them over there, and this was for me and nobody else, and it's mine, 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 precious. <laughs> no one else can have it. But it was wearing me down. Wearing me down, try to be all of these different people at different times in different spheres. It's a hard masquerade to keep going. It's tiresome. And ultimately, it's, it's an exercise in spending so much personal energy in an exercise that is ultimately futile because, as a wise woman reminded me so many years ago, finally, the spirit the spirit of life, the spirit of love, the human spirit is going to go where it wants to go. So the walls you're putting up aren't real anyway. And you're just going to wear yourself out trying to keep them up. Instead, what if you lived with all of that flowing within you and without you, back and forth, in and out, like a Mobius strip, says Parker Palmer. Everything that is you, every integral piece of you, constantly, at all times, a life of integrity, you living in wholeness, That's the exercise we're trying to engage here as spiritual people. Growing our souls into a sense of wholeness, accepting ourselves as we are, naming everything broken and whole within us, not to say it's an excuse, this is just how I am and I will never change, 
but to be who we are, fully and committed at all times. Our lives are a constant struggle to maintain this shape, this sense of constant flow, the wholeness of ourselves into the world, and we're constantly bouncing back and forth between this walled self and this integral self because it's hard to do this. There are times when it is tiring and you want to retreat back into the walls. I don't want to give you this piece of myself. I want to hang on to it for me and only me. And often, we encounter so many people still living in this walled existence, still putting forward the best facade, that when they encounter someone who is trying their best to live in the sense of flow and integrity, an existential threat becomes obvious. I don't want to be like that, so I better push this person back inside their walls. There will be resistance to you living your life in wholeness, especially when someone is only showing the best of themselves or the facade of the best of themselves. There's a desire to want to match that. There's that Facebook game we play where everything is wonderful all the time and we start to beat down on ourselves more because they've got it all together, why don't I? But we know that's not the case. And still we feel this desire to retreat, to live inside those walls. But what if? What if instead of retreating, what if instead of going back into the walled life, when we encounter someone who doesn't want to see us in our integrity, what if instead of retreating behind the wall again, we put our hand on the tether? I love that image that Parker Palmer gives us in that introduction of tying the line to home when you know the blizzard is coming so you can find your way back. Now, think about our own principle of the interconnected web of all creation. And think about that tether. And imagine that you are tethered to everyone, everything, connected inextricably and that tether is not just to home, but a two-way street between you and another. What if when someone wants to push you back behind the wall, you doubled down on your integrity and your wholeness and held that tether out? What if you lived your life with such integrity that someone else had a chance to find their way home for themselves? might just be one person. There might be just one person out there who takes the chance on that, who looks at you and instead of being threatened by integrity, says that is who I want to be, and puts their hand on the tether. Might be just one person. But here's the thing, and I've said it before, and I'll probably say it over and over again. The only person in the world you have any control over is your own self. So why not double down on the integrity? Because even though you only have control over your own self, the way you present yourself in the world has the opportunity to impact, to inspire, to instruct someone else. And so, lo and behold, you find someone else who wants to be like you, who wants to live their life the way you do, in integrity, in wholeness, and you come together, drawn together by that tether, that inextricable link that binds us all together, and you find just one person 
whose talents fill in the gaps of your flaws, whose smoothness roughs out your own hard edges, and vice versa. Who makes you more whole because they are present with you? What changes in the world from just the drawing together of those two? But now you have two, and it's a powerful beacon, and somebody else wants to be that way, and three come in, and four, and so on, and so on. Everybody filling in one another's flaws and gaps and talents, creating even more wholeness as they draw together. And oh no, folks, it looks like we kind of accidentally stumbled into a community. That's an attractive prospect, this community. Everybody might be at different stages of their wholeness and their integrity. Heck, even some people who are still stuck behind their walls are going to see what is being built and want to be a part of that. And soon you've got a group of people at various stages of their spiritual maturity, of their personal maturity, of their ability to deal with people. And now you've got a chance for some brokenness inside that wholeness of community you were finding. Because people just want to belong to something, whether they're feeling whole or not. It might be tempting to start to wall up in that group. It might be tempting to retreat behind that wall on a larger scale. So how do we maintain that sense of wholeness? How do we keep that momentum going on a larger scale as more and more people are drawn together or at least begin to see the reality of their connections to one another? I think the answer lies in developing a sense of ourselves as part of something larger, developing some kind of sense of what it means to be connected with all we can see and all we cannot see. That might be your concept of God or, or the spirit of life and love, or let's call it the great heart at the center of everything, that metaphor that I love. Okay, great, John, but that's way too, too big to contemplate. That's too much. That's, that's just uber conceptual and a little too esoteric. Could we please just maybe do the large scale thing in some kind of smaller format? Can, can we do that? Something manageable, something bite sized? Sure. I got back two weeks ago from our annual Mexico mission with our youth from here and the United Church my fourth time going on the trip. And it's almost the same every time. But it wasn't until this trip I was able to like put words to what I was experiencing with our teens. Now, put 35 teenagers together in a room. What do you think might happen? We know high school life is, is, is chaotic. We know that many ids with underdeveloped super egos are going to be all kinds of interesting cliques and groups and relationships getting together. And, and high school is hard. And I don't know what their lives are like in school. I know there are divisions. I know there are cliques. I know there are, are, are deep personal animosities sometimes between our youth. Heck, it happens with adults too. I don't know what the divisions look like. But for one week in the desert, 35 overdeveloped ids with underdeveloped super egos got together and none of that was evident. None of it. Were they all 35 BFFs forever? No, no. That level of intimacy was not quite there, but the animosity was gone too, for one simple reason. They had a project. They had a mission. We call it the mission trip for a reason. Build three houses for people in need. Give up your week of vacation to do something good for others and leave the world a little better than you found it.
Every lick of evidence of what could be broken in their lives was just not evident because there was a purpose. And that is how we build wholeness on the small scale. That is how we build wholeness in these small C communities, these groups we come together and build because we want to belong and we desire this wholeness. And it's in that small scale, it's in that small C community where our power for transformation in the world truly lies. It's just as it's only the self we have control over when we are coming together in communities, it is only in the community in front of us that we can actually reach out and touch where we have any control in the larger world. And just as with ourselves, how we present ourselves as a community in our wholeness or in our brokenness has the capacity to impact or inspire or instruct another to hold out that tether, that lifeline, to shine a light on that connection that's already there. The life of faith asks big things of us, huge things, impossible things, transformation of the world on a cosmic scale. The transformative power of love, turning the world as it is into the world as it could be at its best. And when you hear that from a pulpit, you would be completely justified in turning around and walking out of the church again because who has time for that? That's too big. I'm just one person. But this wholeness, whether it's on the personal scale or the cosmic scale, is constantly a work in progress. We are shifting constantly back and forth between the walled life and the life of integrity. All we can hang on to is this within our own selves and this within the community I can reach out and touch right now. To put it all back together, I have to put the person back together first. All of a sudden, it's so much easier to hold everything in love begins with that kindness and acceptance of self. A willingness to live integral, with integrity. And it begins with a sense of deep purpose in our communities. Because without that, we scatter and fall apart and retreat to the walls again. And with that, we shine the light on and we strengthen that one thread in that interdependent web, one thread in that fabric that we can add to a fabric that holds everything. May it be so.